Countries across the world are committing on one time scale or another to net zero carbon emissions. That is the direction of travel. Well, what happens when we get there? Some people argue that whatever we do with reducing greenhouse gas emissions, future warming is already so baked into the system that catastrophe awaits anyway. Others were puzzled that over the course of the lockdowns of a pandemic, why temperatures didn't go down, given that emissions clearly had. There's obviously some confusion about just what is expected to happen and what is not expected to happen when we actually hit that net zero line. So let's have a look. This question, what will happen when we reach net zero? It is actually quite an important one because people are being told all sorts of things. So, for instance, Chris Hedges, a journalist friend and ally to Extinction Rebellion's Roger Hallam, puts it like this. The global catastrophe that awaits us, already baked into the ecosystem from the failure to curb the use of fossil fuels and animal agriculture, presage new, deadlier pandemics, mass migrations of billions of desperate people, plummeting crop yields, mass starvation and systems collapse. And if that wasn't enough, he added this. Even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, we still face catastrophe. Anything above a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius will render the Earth uninhabitable. In that latter prediction, he said he was quoting a 2018 IPCC report on the 1.5 degrees C level. It's important to note at this point, no, that report does not for one moment suggest that anything above 1.5 degrees renders the Earth uninhabitable. Saying that isn't to underplay the fact that it does say some perfectly serious things, makes it clear we would be better served by staying under that threshold if possible. But those words by Chris Hedges of a sort that then get quoted all over social media and through constant repetition come to be held as being unquestionably scientifically true. They help to drive a common perception. Like this statement, we have 3 degrees C baked into the system. That's the idea that there are various tipping points that have already been triggered and so things will simply keep getting warmer. Certainly on that other question, why things didn't get cooler with the pandemic lockdown, nobody should be surprised that that was the case. Because simply put, emissions didn't stop. And it would be amazing if they had. Now sure, people stopped flying in any significant numbers, and many fewer people in some parts of the world used their cars to do a daily commute. Some parts of the world, not many others. I mean, China, India, most of Africa... And wherever you were, the lights stayed on. All the power plants kept going, including all those coal-fired power stations in different parts of the world, and a lot of the heavy industry. Also, you kept eating food, I'm guessing. So all the emissions from agriculture, luckily for us, didn't stop. And so on and so on. The outcome of all of that is that the worldwide emissions of CO2 dropped just by 5.4% in 2020, which is a drop but within the scale of natural variability caused by numerous other factors. Maybe not everyone who issues that particular challenge on lockdown's effect on emissions does so in good faith, but it's worth reflecting that it wouldn't be surprising if some people were confused. The amount of attention that goes on to lifestyle elements, especially flying and driving your car, does give the impression those aspects are a much bigger part of the whole than they actually are. But OK, what about this question of net zero? The first thing to note is that people saying that additional warming is baked in may or may not be right. We'll come to that. But at least they're not just making it up. There have been articles like this one in January last year. Warming already baked in will blow past climate goals. And that was drawing from this peer-reviewed study from Zhao et al., Greater committed warming after accounting for the pattern effect. And the article put it like this. For decades, scientists have talked about so-called committed warming or the increase in future temperature based on past carbon dioxide emissions that stay in the atmosphere for well over a century. It's like the distance a speeding car travels after the brakes are applied. 
But Monday's study in the journal Nature Climate Change calculates that a bit differently, and now figures for carbon pollution already put in the air will push global temperatures to about 2.3 degrees Celsius, 4.1 degrees Fahrenheit, of warming since pre-industrial times. Previous estimates, including those accepted by international science panels, were about a degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, less than that amount of committed warming. So that was just a year and a half ago. You might feel things maybe have changed since then. So this article, for instance. Many scientists now say global warming could stop relatively quickly after emissions go to zero. And that paper says this. Recent research shows that stopping greenhouse gas emissions will break the vicious cycle of warming temperatures, melting ice, wildfires and rising sea levels faster than expected just a few years ago. There is less warming in the pipeline than we thought, said Imperial College London climate scientist Jersey Rergel a lead author of the next major climate assessment from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is our best understanding that if we bring down CO2 to net zero, the warming will level off. The climate will stabilise within a decade or two, he said. There will be very little to no additional warming. Our best estimate is zero. The article explained it like this. The widespread idea that decades or even centuries of additional warming are already baked into the system, as suggested by previous IPCC reports, were based on an unfortunate misunderstanding of experiments done with climate models that never assumed zero emissions. You can see why this might be confusing. But let's be clear about the two different things we're talking about. So those older computer models presumed that the world reached a state where CO2 levels in the atmosphere stopped growing and remained stable at current levels. So on the face of it, you'd intuitively say that was a reasonable presumption. We know that CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a long time. So when you stopped adding excess, you might well presume that just means it stops and stays put. In that situation, some additional warming would continue to take place for an extended period of time before levelling off. But we're now saying we no longer believe that levels stay the same post net zero. In that situation, we now expect that greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere would fall a certain amount quite quickly before then stabilising. That fall would offset the factors providing that additional warming, so the aggregate effect would mean that it flatlines. No more growth trend, just the standard year-to-year -year variability that you see anyway. The drop would be limited, however. After it had happened, whatever changes had occurred before net zero was achieved would likely stay in place. Assuming that is that we don't develop the technology to pull the CO2 out of the air at a scale that's not currently possible. It shouldn't be a surprise that people have been confused. After all, the reports have been confused and the institutions themselves have been confused. So, for example, NASA now says on its briefing, is it too late to prevent climate change, that if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, the rising global temperatures would begin to flatten within a few years. Temperatures would then plateau, but remain well elevated for many, many centuries. There is a time lag between what we do and when we feel it, but that lag is less than a decade. But as recently as April last year, it was saying something quite different. Even if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, global warming would continue to happen for at least several more decades, if not centuries. So I guess it's not surprising if a lot of campaigners and others who don't follow this stuff closely day to day will have been left with a sense that authoritative sources take a view that is now outdated. So how did this come to be the case? Writing on the Carbon Brief website, climate scientist Zeke Hausfather described it like this. Until the mid-2000s, many climate models were unable to test the impact of emissions reaching zero. This is because they did not include modelling of biogeochemical cycles, such as the carbon cycle, and could not effectively translate emissions of CO2 into atmospheric CO2 concentrations. As a result, climate models tended to be run with scenarios of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, 
rather than emissions, and often examined what would happen if atmospheric CO2 levels remained fixed at current levels into the future. In other words, the models could say if CO2 levels are stable at this level, then this is what will happen. And the answer to that was if it was stable, then some warming would continue to happen. Why? Because of how the oceans would continue to warm up to reach the same temperature as the atmosphere. The Earth is always moving towards a point of equilibrium where what's being absorbed from the Sun is equal to the amount that's being re-radiated back out into space. If more is coming in and going out, then the planet warms up until it reaches the point where the amount it's radiating back out again has now once again regained balance. The warmer the planet, the more energy it radiates. So those models tended to suggest that around up to half a degree Celsius of additional warming would happen if CO2 levels were stable. But the models couldn't say whether the CO2 levels would be stable because they weren't factoring in the carbon cycle. Doing that is a whole additional level of complexity. So the carbon cycle is the natural process whereby some CO2 naturally gets emitted into the atmosphere and some CO2 naturally gets absorbed by other natural processes. Without human contributions, that cycle is largely in balance over the short term. Over geological time frames, hundreds of thousands or millions of years, CO2 eventually weathers out of the atmosphere, a process that ultimately contributes to glaciations. However, we now believe that if the artificially high emissions that we're currently producing, if they were stopped altogether, net zero in other words, the short term effect would be for a reduction of concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, as some of the carbon sinks would continue to absorb CO2 at a higher level before stabilising. So, for example, this figure, adapted by Carbon Brief from a 2010 paper by Damon, Matthews and Weaver, the red line is what would be projected to happen if a world hit constant concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere from 2020 onwards. You can see there's still a gradual increase. Versus the blue line, what would happen if society achieved net zero, which effectively flatlines? Those are trend lines, of course. The reality would have the same natural variability you can see in the historical record. The flatlining reflects two effects that cancel each other out. One is the continued warming effect from the warming of the oceans. The other is the fact that a percentage of the extra CO2 that humans emit is being absorbed. So I said that the carbon cycle was largely in balance before humans started adding those extra emissions. But what we've seen for a long time was that as we started to increase the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, more of it was naturally absorbed than had been being before. Which makes sense, right? If a liquid absorbs a gas, then you're going to expect it to absorb more of that gas from an air mix that has lots of it than from one that only has a small percentage of it. Now, the increased absorption wasn't enough. So the concentrations in the atmosphere have steadily risen the more CO2 we've emitted. But not as much as it would have done if there had been no absorption by the various natural carbon sinks. So when we hit net zero, for a while, those carbon sinks will continue to overperform. And so the carbon concentrations in the air will reduce until slowing down and stabilising. At that point, it will take those many hundreds of thousands of years for the CO2 to substantially fall any further. The evidence for all of this has been building. So, for instance, with this paper by Madugal et al. in 2020, they began to look at the issue with more modern climate models that begin to include the carbon cycle. And we have now seen what's called the Zero Emissions Commitment Model Intercomparison Project, ZECMIP which used 18 such models to review the question and found similar results, that initial dip in concentrations. As always, there's some degree of uncertainty, and that's reflected in those models that gave an average of flatlining, but with a variation of 0.3 degrees C of cooling to 0.3 degrees C of warming. Ten of the models showed surface temperature changes close to zero, three of them showed cooling, two of them showed warming. You can see in this graph the interplay between the different factors with ocean heat, ocean absorption of CO2, land absorption of CO2 and overall forcing the push for additional warming or not.
And this graph shows how that last element plays out when you order them by the amount of cooling to warming. But there's a certain amount of additional variation because so far we've just been talking about CO2. Now CO2 is the most important greenhouse gas because it's the most persistent in the atmosphere, but it's not the only greenhouse gas and it's not the only other factor affecting the temperature of the planet. So other greenhouse gases such as methane are important because they are more short-lived but more powerful than CO2. But at the same time there are the sulphate aerosols that we mentioned that come from the other emissions we create, those that have a net cooling effect. The planet would have warmed significantly more if it wasn't for those. So if those reduce, then of course that could have the opposite effect. It could create warming. And under most scenarios, you probably end up reducing both at the same time. This graph shows how that variability plays out. If we had zero new greenhouse gases, but also zero aerosols, then by 2100, the planet would have continued to warm, albeit at a much slower rate. If we achieved zero greenhouse gases while still adding to the aerosols, not really a realistic scenario, then you would get a significant cooling, the yellow line. And that's another key point when we're discussing this whole area. As ever with these things, these are not firm predictions of the future. They're only ever tied to what we do. They are about the consequences of the choices we make. But what about that earlier paper that I mentioned? This was first discussed, Zhao et al. Talking about the warming being baked in. If this is now widely thought not to be the case, what did that paper do that we now believe to be wrong? Climate scientist Stefan Ramsdorf highlighted the arguments as to why he thought the paper was in error, and in any case why the AP News headline that I also showed was definitely wrong. First, yes, the paper presumes that net zero means stable CO2 concentrations, as we've discussed, a presumption that's now strongly deprecated. But secondly, the paper offers figures, if you look at the detail, with a huge range of uncertainty. Ramsdorf said this, with the somewhat more realistic assumption that only long-lived greenhouse gases like CO2 stay at constant levels, their calculation yields a warming range of 1.15 to 16.2 degrees Celsius. No climate model would ever give a crazy global warming of 16 degrees Celsius under this assumption. The point is that although a significant weight of opinion amongst mainstream scientists has moved to this view, it's still clearly a point of live debate. Unsettled, you might say. Every now and then you will still get a paper written by scientists making the doomist case. And such papers naturally get seized upon by those who promote a doomist frame of mind, as well as headline writers, of course. For example, this one by Randers and Galuk in 2020, where they argued that according to their specific climate model, we have already run past tipping points that mean the thawing of permafrost is now self-sustaining. That would, they said, lead to significantly more warming, reaching 3 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial averages by 2500, regardless of future emissions. Now that was published in Nature Scientific Reports, a respected peer-reviewed journal, exactly the sort of credentials that we are meant to take seriously. And the journal publicised the paper with a press release bearing this headline, Ending Greenhouse Gas Emissions May Not Stop Global Warming. So mainstream scientists can dismiss this as deeply flawed, as they did, but you might conclude from that that at least some reasonable people think otherwise. So what is the argument as to why it's deeply flawed? Well, Richard Betts of the UK Met Office said this. There's a new paper out being presented as showing global warming may have already passed a point of no return. But it's based on a model with major flaws. Even the authors don't claim it actually represents reality. Betts was additionally quoted by the Times of London. While the press release suggests that global warming may now be unstoppable for centuries, the model result in this paper is not convincing as support for that message. 
And indeed, in response to the strongly critical response from the community, the paper was slightly amended, but most tellingly, that press release was retracted and replaced by one that admitted that the projection was based on one particular computer model that should be tested, not taken as a prediction of the future. By the way, I will just note in passing that this incident does put the lies of the claims made by some people who describe all climate scientists, not just the extreme campaigners, as so-called alarmists and say that they're always faking results to get the worst possible projections because uh, reasons. That version of reality does not seem compatible with the fact that they actually do jump on claims that go the other way when they are not based on solid evidence. That's not to suggest they're perfect, just that those caricatures are clearly not a good representation of reality. We should be sceptical of such claims. I just mention it in passing. Grown-up people would never have thought it was otherwise. The others won't accept it regardless. But you never know. It's worth saying nonetheless. The people on each extreme will promote whatever supports their pre-existing message regardless. The environmental campaigners who claim to be following the science, will nevertheless attack the scientists when they don't conform to what they want. So, for example, this one. Many mainstream climate scientists making a fool of themselves, suggesting that we can keep below 1.5 or 2 Celsius. So few willing to be honest, capital H, in public, capital P, which enables procrastination. Life is so much simpler when your definition of honesty in public, capital H, capital P, is whatever agreed with what you already thought. So, in conclusion, nothing in any of this suggests we should not be taking action in the short term towards an ultimate destination of net zero. As I always say, as fast as possible, but not faster. But likewise, nothing here supports the doomist arguments of cross-tipping points, baked-in changes that means you should be going on a zen retreat to make peace with the world before it all ends in flames. I mean, if you decide to believe that anyway, fine, it's up to you. People have all sorts of faith-based beliefs. You shouldn't claim, however, that it's in some way following the current state of the science, because it doesn't support it. By the way... I recently made a video that looked deeper into what the mainstream science actually does say on the question of whether or not climate change is human caused, a question that people often ask when we get to these topics. If you've made it this far, you might want to watch that video next.